first broadcast for I Love Cinema, where I'll just be talking about um, movies, uh, pretty much. Uh, if you've seen, uh, well, seen, if you've listened to any of my uh, previous podcasts uh, that I did last year, uh, it was called Weekly Watch, um, and I was talking pretty much on a weekly basis about all the films that I was watching, and that's kind of what I'm doing now um, with this one. And um, it's going to be on every Thursday from uh, 8 p.m. onwards, UK time. I, I'm going to be on this channel just talking about whatever films I've been watching throughout the week. And I have not, I've never done this before. Or oh, you can actually see the reflection of my, this way, this way of my laptop in, in there. Um, so let me just see whether this is actually working because like first timer, I really have no idea what I'm doing. Let's have a look if everything is working okay. Um, it says we're live <laughs> for whatever reason. It's not coming up on now. Let's just check that's working. You know, you got to iron out the kinks. Oh, yeah, there we are, actually. Okay, cool. So um, I've not really worked on my... Um, on my graphics or anything i just realized literally five seconds ago i was like shit i don't have i don't have any graphics and i need to remember i turned my iphone around there i'm looking at this and not at this okay cool all right so here we go um what i will be like i said i've not worked anything out here yet let's see if this is actually working yes there we go pacific rim let's see whether this is actually working so you can read it the right side around perfect that's how we want it. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, Pacific Rim. Um, what was the other one? <laughs> Pacific Rim, Ready Player One, and Unsane. Those were the three films that I've watched in like the last week or two. Um, but before I get into that, I wanted to quickly talk about uh, like news or trailers or anything. Um, that I find uh, newsworthy, something I just want to share. And usually there's not really much where I'm like, oh my God, have you seen this? But this week, a few days ago, um, the trailer for Terminal hit. Um, that's a, bear with me. Oh, tea, always good. I live in London, you know, even though I'm not British, but I've assimilated, you need to have tea. Um, so Terminal, uh, which is not the terminal, which used to be uh, or is a Tom Hanks film where he's stuck in the terminal, like based on a true story. Uh, terminal is a um, a film with Margaret Robbie. And that's literally all I needed to know. Two words that make me go see every film that no matter the genre, no matter who's the director, no matter what it's about, Margaret Robbie's in it, I'm going to go and watch it. And it looks really cool. Like I'd seen the teaser and it looked very neo-noirish, um, which is something that I quite like. It was like very saturated and high contrast and really dark and gritty. It looked fantastic. Just from the cinematography's point of view, um, I was immediately like, this looks interesting. Um, and then I heard Margaret Robbie do doing the voiceover and she's apparently playing a slightly crazy person. I was like, of course I'm gonna go watch that. So I'm gonna actually check, let me check that into, into the chat. My computer's really slow, which is not very helpful. So bear with me. I mean, it's the first show, right? Ironing out kinks and stuff. So let me just chuck the terminal trailer in here, if it lets me. Seriously, I need to buy a new laptop. Uh, mm -mm, say something. I'm saying this. I hope it works. So just click on that. Um, that's going to be the. Oh, I'm showing up on here. So I'm broadcasting uh via my phone uh, i had planned on on doing that uh, that's not me farting that's just the chair you know or is it anyway um i was planning on using like obs studio to like broadcast from my laptop and it's just gonna be awesome and you can have like graphics coming in left and right and like writing here and writing there and scrolling and like all the shiny mega things and then, of course, for whatever reason, OBS decided not to work with my laptop. So that was a bit of a downer. Um, but trusty phone that I have. So that's what I'm broadcasting from. So there we go. Um, all right. So check out the Terminal trailer. Margaret Robbie looks really awesome. Um, she's apparently also doing, was it a film based on Shakespeare's work? But focusing on the female character, something like that. It sounded fantastic. That broke, I think, last week. So Margaret Robbie is doing like a lot of fantastic things. But 
in regards to news trailers, that's kind of it. Let's talk about this sucker, Pacific Rim. Now, to give you some kind of context, um, I've seen the first one, loved the first one. I thought it was fantastic. I mean, you have ginormous robots and then you have creatures and they're battling each other. I mean, how, what's not to love, right? Um, you have pretty much the same thing here. It's, um, it's kind of like a, a warmed up tea bag. Like if the first one is a tea bag and you're trying to get a second round of tea out of it, that's kind of what Pacific Rim is, unfortunately. Like it's really cool. I, I enjoyed it. But it felt more like um, more like the same. It's literally like you took the first one, you chucked out the cast from that, chucked a new cast, including John Boyega, who who doesn't like seeing John Boyega. He's he's a really cool actor. He's he's funny and he's captivating, and I really like seeing him. So of course I was gonna watch that, right? Um, and then you you chuck out the old cast, you chuck in the new cast. And a bunch of new robots. You make up some some crazy ass story as to why the rift that they managed to uh, seal at the end of the first one, why that comes back open. Because you need to bring the monsters back, right? Um, so at first it's like ginormous robot versus ginormous robot, which is kind of cool, but it's just not the same. Um, but overall, I thought it, it's it's entertaining. Um, I really liked it, but the story, of course, is like by the numbers. You've seen it before. It's literally like the first one. Everyone comes together, a lot of people more reluctantly than others. And then the special effects are really good. Certain people die and, you know, are are kind of like um, a catalyst for another person going at it and going like, okay, fine, I'm going to work on this, even though I'm really reluctant, I don't really want to. Um, and then monsters show up again and people turn into villains who we thought were not villains. You know, the usual shtick. It's, it's like, literally, it's like paint by the numbers. But it's very entertaining. And especially if you if you like the first one, I think you'll really like the second one. If you don't mind, that is pretty much the same thing. You know, there's nothing new about it. And where the first one kind of wowed me because of the... It was quite innovative, you know. It's like you had these journalists robots and they only functioned because you had two people that had to be in sync, like this mind melt thing had to happen. And it looked really cool. And it, I, I think, was it, did it come out at like similar time with like a Godzilla film or Cloverfield or whatever it is? Because I remember when I watched the first one, I was thinking, you have the robot versus Godzilla fight. You know, even though it's not Godzilla, it's like a kaiju is what they call it, like the sea monster. But you have this ginormous monster fight that you kind of want to see in a Godzilla film. And we didn't get to see it in the Godzilla film. And then Pacific Rim came around and basically gave us what we wanted to see in a Godzilla film, um, which I thought was fantastic because it looked great. Um, the special effects are fantastic. Uh, just like here, you know, same thing. It's literally pretty much identical. Um, it all boils down to like the ginormous megazorus awesome fight at the very end you know where everything comes together and i almost spoiled there i almost spoiled something there so i was like mm, okay um i really liked like the last half hour when it's really going for it um and there are things happening where obviously that's not a spoiler you know the kaijus come back you can't have pacific rim without the kaijus right so the kaijus come back and they're going to explain that story-wise why that's happening and blah, 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 blah. no one really cares we just want them to come back so they can fight the big robots right um and they introduce i think that they make the main cast younger than the previous cast was i'm not entirely sure to be fair i haven't seen the first pacific rim since it came out um i think it's on netflix but i've not watched it yet i actually wanted to re-watch it um but it's, it's really cool and I, I like that they introduced a really young character there who was, it's kind of like, I mean, it's based on highly influenced by anime and stuff. So if you're into that kind of stuff, I think you're going to love Pacific Rim no matter what. And I love anime. So you usually have like a really young character who, for whatever reason, is the person that saves the planet. Um, and I think Pacific Rim is kind of like that. There's a there's a young girl introduced very early on, and she's just really she's really capable, and she knows what she's doing, and she 
she builds it like that's not i think that's not a spoiler she builds her own little valkyrie like the robot but of course it's not like this ginormous thing that you need two people to to maneuver to it's like a smaller version but she built this by herself and it's really fantastic and she she calls it scrapper and it's just really cute and adorable and she and she fights this big robot and that's really early on in the film so that's not really spoiler territory um and it looks really cool and she's just really sassy and she knows what she's doing and you know she can take care of herself and you know that she is basically um the lead even though john boyega and um i almost called him clint eastwood right now that's not his name clint eastwood's son scott eastwood he's in this as well um those two are basically uh the the leads you could say you have to um, the scientists come back from the first one like the the weird looking guy who usually and i mean weird looking in, a, in like a good way i'm weird looking it's a good thing right character face um, but you have that weird looking scientist who usually plays um, evil people just because of how his face looks. Uh, I love it. He's, it's such a memorable face. It's brilliant. And the other guy who's more like, can't remember his name, can't remember the character or the actor's name. He's just, it's, it's the generic bureaucrat that turns evil that you know is just like has some evil thing going on. Like Paul Reiser in Aliens. You know, you just know it's like he's up to no good, right? Um, that kind of, like the Paul Reiser character in Pacific Rim. So he comes back and they actually work really well with the story and how it's explained why the Kaijus come back. But we don't really care about that, do we? We just want to see ginormous robots, ginormous monsters coming together and fucking fight it out. And that is awesome. It really is. Um, it's so much fun. Oh, I have to... I don't know what we call it. Screen saver, battery saver. Don't do that again. Um, but yeah, it's it's fantastic. It's a lot of fun. It's it's not something I think you're gonna take home with. Um, not some something that lingers. But grab a bucket of popcorn and and you're gonna have a lot of fun with it. And John Boyega, he he's just a really good actor. He he's like um. I mean, I've seen him play really dramatic in Detroit if you've not seen that you need to check that out he's really good in that um, and something very different because usually like in Star Wars and here as well he's kind of like um, I'm not sure how I should say it's, it's, he's not just cheeky he's he's like like a Han Solo type almost he's like this charismatic not necessarily good guy, guy but also not the bad guy so he, he just really knows how to work the screen how to captivate an audience how to draw them in and how to engage them um, and he does the same thing here and I think that's just him it doesn't matter what character it is uh, what character he's playing this is just the John Boyega essence that he brings to every character that he plays and he does that wonderfully like I really resonate with that I really like his approach he just makes everything fun he really digs into his dialogue makes it his own and he's just having so much fun dishing it out um and that is just a marvel to behold like i really love it how he works the screen how he works with the camera um and for that alone like if you like john boyega you have to go and see this like seriously he's he's great and he works really well with scott eastwood who's playing the more bland character you could say um like I said, you, you have the, the, the scrappy little girl who is fantastic. And you just uh, and there's also actually a lot of diversity in the cast um, because the Valkyrie program has basically been disbanded because obviously they, they closed the rift at the end of the first movie. Um, so there was no need for, for those protectors of the world anymore. Um, so everything's basically gone to shit. Um, and there's not really a lot of pilots for these things anymore. And now you have like brand new people coming in. And that's what I liked about it. It's like the cast was very diverse. Like the, there was um, a Latino guy in there as well. There was like a Russian girl, even though she was white. But um, I guess, yeah, there's not really a lot of black people in Russia, is there? Uh, but you had the Asians again. Um, and yeah, I, I loved it. it. It was so diverse. You had John Boyega as the black, a black man. And... Um, I'm making it sound really bad, but it's like I felt like there was a lot of diversity in there. Um, and uh, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of um, a lot of action, as you would expect. Story, not as, not, not as important. But overall, I really enjoyed it. Um, 
I thought it was a bit of a lukewarm, lukewarm, uh, like regurgitated version of the first one. But then the first one was fantastic. So I think that's not that big of a deal. Um, so go and see Pacific Rim Uprising. And with that, there we go. Now this is the real sucker I want to talk about. Ready Player One. Now, um, if you're a Cineworld Unlimited holder, you got to watch that. I think, was it like two weeks ago, something like that, one and a half weeks ago, they had the Unlimited screening going on and it's fantastic. Um, I've, I've not read the book. I don't know anything about the book, but the funny thing is I had a lady sitting next to me and she knew the book and it was interesting to see my reaction and her reaction to things that were going on. Because Ready Player One is, I think it runs for like two hours, 20 minutes. It's actually quite a long film. And it is a roller coaster ride. I, it's crazy. Um, I need to learn to look into the camera. Um, it's a roller coaster ride. I didn't see it in 3D. Um, that's why I'm going to see it again this weekend because I really want to need, uh, I really need to see it in 3D. Um, but it's like an assault on the senses. It's just like, bam, 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 bam. There's so much going on. Like, you need to see this film, I think, at least 10 times. There are so many, so many little tidbits here and there. Not just visually, but also audio. There's just... You, you're just going to miss so much if you just watch it once. And if, if you're into video games and into movies, pop culture references, whatever it is, if you're into that kind of stuff, you got to watch this because it's fantastic. It's chock full of this entire stuff. And the, I think the first hour, first the first half of the film, I was literally in, in my seat going, like, wow, there's so much going on. It's like, Batman, the Batmobile, old school Batmobile, the Turtles, Halo, Overwatch, Back to the Future. You know, all of that stuff was in there and, and, and so much more. There's, there's just, there's so much happening that you're getting the information in and while you're going, wow, and I got to remember that something else comes in, so pushes that out. So it's like you can't even, you don't even have enough time to go, wow, because there's so much stuff coming up, um, which is why it's, and I should stop that, uh, which is why it's fantastic to watch. Um, and it feels like, I mean, I love, I love video games. I'm a huge uh, gamer. I mean, I'm, I've got all this, like, I'm using my PS3 to show you this stuff. Um, and it's just so much fun. It's so fast paced. I literally felt like I hadn't taken a breath in about an hour. I was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. N no way. Like, that's all you can do because there's so much stuff going on. It is absolutely brilliant. Now, one of the things, um, if you don't know what Ready Player One is about, I also didn't really say <laughs> about Pacific Rim. Monsters, kaijus, worlds at stake, we're fighting. Pacific Rim, um, actually, let's see. What does IMDb say about this? And I'm doing this while my computer is mega slow. Um, I was actually wondering when I was looking up, um, I was writing a review uh, earlier for another film. Uh, if I have time, I'm going to talk about that as well. Um, and I sometimes look up like the summary or the synopsis on IMDb and sometimes on Wikipedia. And I was, I was wondering, it's like, if you do that, when, when you read like a title of a film and you go, like, oh, I wonder what that's, that is about. Where do you go and check? Do you go to IMDb? Do you go to Wikipedia? Do you, do you not, do you not check? Do you check with a person? Do you have like, um, like a film reviewer or something where you go it's like let's see what that person has said about it i really want to know what people uh usually do um because for me i usually check imdb and wikipedia and then just figure out which of the two i prefer um it doesn't always work because sometimes they're very they're worded really weirdly so um for pacific uh, for pacific rim for uh, ready player one um it's in the near future as far as i understand and uh, everyone, no matter your income or your social status, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, has some kind of access to a VR environment uh, called the Oasis. Um, some dude has invented there, like in a few previous decades, whatever it was. Um, and that inventor also plays um, quite into that, into that story. And there's like some shit happening in the Oasis. 
And um, sorry, my spoon. Um, let's see what Wiki says. Oh no, it says from filmmaker Steven Spielberg. Oh God, that, that is ginormous. Let's not do that. Maybe let's go to IMDb. They're usually short and snappy, aren't they? Mm -mm -mm. Ready, play one. Here we go. So I, it's it's all about the creator of the Oasis and that he put, left like a puzzle or something in the Oasis of where if you find three keys that are hidden somewhere deep in the Oasis, the Oasis is the VR world uh, that everyone has access to. Um, if you find those three keys, you basically take over the Oasis. Like this guy is like mega rich and he died or whatever. Uh, and he was like, if you get these three keys, which are so hard to get, like no one's ever done it, which is why most people have sort of kind of given up doing it. They're like, no one can do this ever. So he's, um, he says, like, if you get all three keys, you can take over Oasis. You're going to get the entire company's yours, which is like, I don't know, however many billions of dollars, right? Um, and you can just take it over and you're going to be mega rich. So, of course, our... Our main kid is very interested in doing that. So let's see, IMDb says, when the creator of a virtual reality world called the Oasis dies, he re so called the Oasis when he dies, he releases a video in which he challenges all Oasis users to find his Easter egg, which will give the finder his fortune. Okay, that sums it up quite well. And then um, obviously our lead guy is is into that he really knows the life of this creator really well like basically what he had for breakfast when he was 20 years old that's the kind of information this guy has like he really knows it um his name is wade uh, aka percival that's his name in the oasis and um the film starts out with like a ginormous car race which you have to complete in order to get the first key People have found that out as like common knowledge. Everyone knows that. So everyone is like going to this car race, which no one's ever managed to win because it's fucking impossible. Um, and everyone's trying to win it to get the first key. You get the first key, you get the next clue, and then you're trying to, you know, win over the world. And of course, as always, there's like some evil corporation there that is interested in getting that key as well because they want to take over the oasis because they want to take over the world because that's you know what evil corporations do right it's in the handbook um so you get a lot of minions from that corporation trying to raise you get our little hero trying to raise and that's where olivia cook comes in who's in this film as well she plays artemis uh, aka samantha um She's really cool. Like she has a really cool introduction and she has a really cool motorbike and she's just really awesome. And everyone is um, like dressed really differently. You, you have your avatar, like your virtual representation of yourself, which doesn't have to look anything like you, which is also quite interesting. So there's of course like quite an homage to the internet, the anonymity there, how you can pretend to be like, a petite Asian girl, even though you're like a big black guy from the Bronx or whatever, um, because no one can really know. And it's really interesting, those those different things, like the real world, which you get to see the real world, you get to see the Oasis, and the Oasis is obviously a lot of fun. Like there are all these different worlds within the Oasis, and it's just like, wow, this is amazing. I get why people live in there. Like they don't live in reality anymore. They're just plucked in all the time because it's so much fun in there. Like you, you can, I think you can earn a living in there as well, if I understand, uh, understood this correctly. Um, so it's basically our little tiny underdog fighting the evil corporation that's trying to take over the world. That's kind of Ready Player One. And then of course, as is the case, they're, they're gonna get through all the quests to get to the other quests, to get to the key, to get the, the riches trying to you know battling the evil organization the entire time that's the entire gist of the film and on this way there of course he's gonna meet the rebels who are trying to save the world from the evil organization anyway and so he joins the rebels it's kind of like star wars you know because basically most of these um of these stories have a common denominator um but it's a lot of fun the special effects are fantastic the acting is really good i really enjoyed that and I think because I'm a video gamer as well, this entire, you have to overcome this obstacle to get this key. 
to get over there and get another like puzzle piece and then you're like now i have to figure out this puzzle piece so i know where i'm going next and this whole like quest a to quest b to quest c to quest d to get to the main big badass boss who you then have to defeat in order to save the princess or whatever that's kind of what ready player one is and it's a lot of fun oh you're doing it again stop it um and it's yeah it's a lot of fun i I rarely had so much fun in the cinema, especially the first half. I was literally just like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Like, it's it's nonsensical, it's, it's not very deep or anything, but it's just so much fun. This is literally like, you sometimes say it's like, it's a roller coaster ride when, when you're describing a film because it's just like relentless and going bam, 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 bam. But this one, this one is actually a roller coaster ride. There's just so much happening. It doesn't let up. It doesn't get boring. There's not even like a minute here or a minute there where you're like, and breathe. No, it's like, bam, going from there, going there, going there, going there. It's like, I, I didn't even have time to, to even go to my makeup. I'm like, oh my God, that was kind of awesome. Without going into any detail. We didn't have time for that. There is no time for that. There's so much stuff going on. You, you just can't, right? And that is fantastic. Like that race that I was talking about, it's crazy. It's a crazy ass race. It could be straight out of a video game. It is just ridiculous the shit that comes up in that race. And it's like, oh my God, a game is so rigged, you know, smashing the car and, and everything. It's like, oh, why did that just come out of the ground? And why did that come from the side? And what's King Kong doing here? You know, literally, actually. Um, and it's fantastic. And also how to to solve the the issue of trying to get the key. It's just like everything just plays into that. And this is literally Spielberg at his best, I think. I mean, I'm, I mean, I love you know Jurassic Park. I love Schindler's List. I mean, how, can you even say you love Schindler's List? Because that sounds a bit fucked up. But you know what I mean, right? I do appreciate it when he does drama and really highbrow stuff. Um, I mean, I even liked AI for for a bit. Like, not everything, but I, I really enjoyed that as well. But this is more like... I don't really want to say Indiana Jones popcorn flick. But almost. It's, it's like the kiddie version of it. And when I say kiddie version, actually, um, I think it's not on here. But the film is like a 12A. Just a quick warning to any guardians or parents or anyone who thinks about taking younger children into this film... It is a 12A, which means that you can take young kids with you as long as you're there with them. However, there is a sequence pretty much in the middle of the film that... It's a bit scary, you know, and, and visually so more than audio. But I, I don't really want to give too much away because it's quite a spoiler as to what's going on there. But it's not for young children. And as soon as you hear in the film that they're going where they're going to go, you're like, um, this is referencing, I don't know what that film was. Was it rated R? Was it 18, 16? But it's, it's more like an adult themed, and I'm not talking about porn, but it's, it's, um, it's definitely more of like a grown up thing to watch, like a horror thing to watch. And why they chose to put that in there, maybe it's in the book, I have no idea. It felt a bit ill-placed. For the grown-ups, I think it was a lot of fun because it's absolutely hilarious how they depict it and how it's interwoven with the story and stuff. It's really fantastic. And the way they recreated some of that stuff is great. And you will know exactly what I'm talking about once you watch the film. Um, however, here I don't really want to give it away. Um, but a lot of the imagery in that section... Uh, I had a dad with his son sitting in the row in front of me and I could tell that the dad wasn't really interacting with the son but then that section came up and all of a sudden the dad, the dad was checking on his son like every minute or so because some of the stuff was really, really heavy, I think. Um, depends on the kid, obviously. I think that child was about like eight years old and I, obviously I didn't know the kid but I would have gone like, hmm... If I'd known that that is in the film, maybe I would have watched it first. Uh, so be cautious. Um, I really wouldn't take children into the film who are 
I don't know, below, I don't know, eight, eight years old or something. Um, because that section could potentially be very traumatic and nightmarish. Um, I mean, it is, I'm going to tell you, it's referencing a horror movie. So, the, you know, there, there are bits of a horror movie in Ready Player One. So you might really want to watch that first. Uh, trust me, you need to watch it several times anyway. So go and watch it with your adult friends or more adulty friends um, before you take any kind of child into that. Um, but from uh, from not adult point of view, I really liked the film. I thought it was fantastic. The special effects are great. The pacing is great, especially the first half. So much to take in. And I think, especially if you're a bit older, you will recognize all these references. I mean, there are obviously also references in there for younger audiences. I mean, there are current references in there. That the I can't remember what the character is called from Overwatch. Who looks like it's it's a female character who looks really cute wearing the glasses. I I can't remember the name, but I think she's like a really um, popular character on there. She's in the film, so there's like really new stuff in there as well. Halo, some Halo guys are in there. Um, a lot of really current stuff, but you also get really old stuff. I mean, the car, the DeLorean from Back to the Future is in there. Um, now maybe everyone knows that maybe some younger folks don't know what the fuck that is um, oh yeah by the way I also swear a lot so you've been warned um, so there is stuff in there for younger audiences for older audiences but then with the younger ones if it's too young maybe not the right movie to watch so just keep that in mind um, special effects are really good uh, let me just see what else we had here um, there is something that came up at the end which I thought was quite hilarious you have to um, in order trying to figure out how to get the three keys they go to something called the the library uh, the whatever library I can't remember what the creator was called they mention his name all the time he's like a legend in the Oasis because he created the Oasis and the Oasis is fucking amazing I mean you watch it and yeah the Oasis is fucking amazing whatever you want to do you can do it in there like they even have an adult section like proper R-rated section. Now I'm talking about kind of like porn and stuff. Not that we see that, um, but I think it's mentioned. Um, so you have all of that stuff in there and <laughs> you, be, because they're trying to figure out how to get the keys, they're trying to analyze the life of the creator because it, it's literally like I was making fun of it, going like, oh, he knows what he had for breakfast. But that's kind of like the information that you need to know in order to solve it. So you see the creator's life kind of in flashback, but play down in front of you because we are in a VR world. So you can actually see it right in front of you, which I thought was quite interesting. So you have the guy who's playing the creator show up as well. And throughout the entire film, I was like... I know that guy he feels so familiar but it's, it's not like sometimes you go I know that actor and I just can't come up with the name it was more like nah but he feels so familiar the mannerisms the voice but somehow the look just does I don't know I'm not sure but there, there was this familiarity anyway there's a scene n near the end of the film where that creator literally walks out the door. That's the last time you see him. He walks out the door. It's shortly before the credits roll. And as he walks out the door, and that's not a spoiler, I went, oh my God, it's Mark Rylance. It's fucking Mark Rylance. And I literally screamed through the cinema. I was like, it's Mark Rylance. It's the literally face palm thing going I was like, oh, the entire time was on the tip of my tongue and I just didn't know. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Yeah, it's the kind of go-to actor for Spielberg at the moment, um, Mark Rylance. And he plays a character that I did not necessarily associate with Mark Rylance at all, which is why I was like, oh my God, you'll be fucking kidding me. Um, it was hilarious because throughout the entire, it's, it's like an added layer of entertainment when you're watching a film. It's like, don't get it, something, something, you know, something doesn't really click. And then by the end of the film, it's like, bam, it's like you have a conversation with your mate and then you part ways. And then about like 3 a.m. you go, oh my God, now I know what it is. And the guy goes, oh my God, that's exactly what it was. That's kind of what it was. And I told my mate and he was like, are you kidding me? He's like, yeah, yeah. 
that was Mark Rylance. It's like, that's no way. Because that's so, so not a Mark Rylance role, basically, for me. But yeah, that was that was kind of awesome. Um, let's see, what else did I write down? Um, oh yeah, the one thing um, that I didn't like about the film, which is why I don't say it's like the entire film is like a roller coaster. Second half dips quite a bit when it comes to pacing. Um, because all of a sudden they're realizing we actually have a story to tell and we should have like a point A and a point B and a conclusion. And then you're my warning that I'm talking too much, right? Okay. Um, and then they're like, oh shit, we have to figure out how we're actually going to go through to the conclusion. Um, and this is where it dips, where it's like, oh, now we have to tell you about this and we have to introduce this and now we have to do this so we can get to here. And then there's this conclusion. And that just, it's like literally someone just stepped on the brakes. I was like, oh, okay. Okay, the roller coaster ride's over, almost. There's a tiny bit here and a tiny bit there. But you can tell, it's like the pace comes to a screeching halt compared to the insane ridiculousness. Like in Spaceballs, what is it? Like ludicrous speed or whatever that we were on. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, now we're just driving 60 miles an hour. Um, that's what it feels like. Um, usually I think in a, in another film, it wouldn't have even been memorable. Um, you wouldn't even have noticed as much, but because the pace is so relentless in the first hour, you can't help but notice. It, it is like two halves that don't really gel well. Uh, we also go more into the real world, um, which I thought was quite interesting. And that's where the film to me fell down a bit because obviously you have this whole VR thing versus the real world. VR is nicer than the real world. And there's a lot of shit happening in, in the real world with like uh, society and class and economy and all of that stuff, right? Especially with the evil organization taking over the world. Um, and people preferring this virtual, not real world to the real world. Um, you could have made like quite a profound statement there duck deeper, go below the surface and really analyze stuff and, and maybe have like some some profound message for the viewer or whatever. Maybe that's in the book. Maybe that's why the lady next to me didn't like the film because she's like, why did they change this? And why did they change that? Didn't like it. And I was sitting there going, like, oh my God, that was amazing because I didn't know the book. So um, it is a bit of a shame that they didn't go deeper, but I kind of get that they were like, let's just have this be a popcorn flick let's have it be easy entertainment um because it works like that it is a bit of a shame because the premise is there and all these layers are there and you could so dig deep in there and and really go for like this almost cerebral experience instead of like a popcorn flick experience um but they're shying away from that and i think that's not necessarily a bad thing um, because it works for the film, because it is just superficial entertainment. It's, it's kind of like a Fast and Furious film. You know, it, it looks good, you've got some cool characters, some crazy shit happens, but overall it's just over-the-top bullshit. And that's kind of what Ready Player One is as well. Just more for... more family-friendly, you could say. Um, except for that tiny bit in the middle. So overall, I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, it's... It's great. If if you know pop culture, if you love video games, you got to watch it. Because the, it, especially the first, first hour is like a video game. You're going to love it. Um, if you love movies, you're going to go and see it. Like If you like movies, TV, like any kind of pop culture stuff from the last, I don't know, like 30, 40 years, something like that. All kinds of shit is in there. There's so much stuff in there. Sometimes they talk about it, they mention it, and then the, the creature goes, hi. And sometimes it's just in the background somewhere and you're like, wait, what's that? And it's gone. Um, so I think it's gonna work really well once it hits Blu-ray and video on demand and you can like freeze frame it. And you can go like, mm, 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 mm. holy crap, that is a Ninja Turtle. I, I still think the Ninja Turtles were in the final showdown at the end. There was like four totally looking people, I don't know. Um, certain ones are featured a bit better than others, but I mean, there, there's little throwaway lines, like dialogue lines. There is certain things, um, like musical cues, um, posters on a wall, um, 
you you even see like that old Batmobile from the old 60s TV series. I think it was the 60s. You know, with Adam West um, as Batman. That Batmobile is in there. And like like all kinds of, of little things. Um, and especially the section in the middle where I was like, oh, it's probably not so, so good for um, for kids. That was so much fun because uh, I wish they'd done that with more films. Like it's, um, it's because of a film um, that they've kind of included there. And the way they've done it, it was... It was so much fun because this is a film that I know really well. And once they tell you that they're kind of going in there and you're like, oh, oh, and then you see things and you're like, oh, oh, and you could tell people in the audience who hadn't seen the film, who didn't know the source material, they didn't know what was going to go. And then other people were like, oh, 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 and there we go. And then everyone's like, oh, my God, what's going on? And everyone else is like, of course, that's going to happen because that's what happens in the film. And that just added another layer of entertainment to it. So you just, it doesn't matter. Seriously, you just got to watch this. This is such a good film. Um, I can't remember the lead guy's name. Whatever. Wade and Samantha are basically going up against some evil corporation. And it's a lot of fun. The, the dialogue is quite funny as well. There's like a lot of sitcom -y stuff uh, in there as well. Um, and what I also liked is that there is a separate layer or an additional layer of this whole like social like how, how do you say that like society critique <laughs> economy critique like all of that stuff i can't think of the proper word right now but it, it's making um like a comment on society on on economy on on where we are um as as a race i think like as the human race and where we're going and what we're doing and where our priorities are and where maybe our priorities should lie um not in the money um so i thought that was that was quite good but it doesn't really delve too deep in there so it's not like it's a cerebral experience <laughs> fuck that not at all it's just a fun popcorn ride and it's fantastic like i said i've not seen it in 3d but I think you need to see it in 3D. Just as we were watching it, I was like, fuck, why are we not watching this in 3D? So I'm going to go and watch it again. Because I need to experience this in 3D. It's so much fun. If you're a video gamer, go and watch it. If you like movies, you go and watch it. If you like action films, you go and watch it. If you only like dramas, like really high cerebral dramas, I don't think you should watch Ready Player One. I don't think it's for you. You know, th this is kind of like the Spielberg film that I always thought people talk about when they go oh et and it's so much fun and it's just so actually no that's not right because et is more heartwarming that's the one thing that ready player one doesn't really have it it doesn't really have a lot of heart it's all shiny exterior it's really pretty shiny exterior and it's quite entertaining shiny ex exterior but there's not really a lot of heart in it which is probably what was missing for me there which is why i wanted it to delve down there Every now and then, especially near the end of the film, they go into that a bit more when obviously, you know, you know what's going to happen. People find all the three keys and then it's like, who's going to get control of the Oasis? Is it Wade and Samantha or is it the evil corporation? And uh, what do you think it's going to be? It's a Spielberg film. What do you think it's going to be, right? Not a spoiler. Um, but there are things like certain scenes that come up um, near the end where it does delve a bit deeper and it does make you think a tiny bit but just as you're starting the process of thinking about things it goes back to being shiny exterior and awesomeness and you're like oh fuck that it's, it's nice it's just just let's let's go popcorn entertainment movie that's good so that's ready player one you have to go and see it this is definitely the thing other than black panther that you need to see and by now who's not seen black panther seriously if if you haven't seen black panther yet what the fuck? Stop watching this. Go to the cinema and get a ticket and watch Black Panther because it's awesome. Otherwise, go and watch this. And our last but not least, let's see. Yeah, there we go. Unsane. The new Soderbergh film uh, with Claire Foy. And uh, in case you don't know who Claire Foy is, you probably do know who Claire Foy is because you probably watched The Crown on Netflix. So she's the queen. That's Claire Foy. 
and she's fantastic. Um, there's the new Untamed is the new Soderbergh film, uh, shot entirely on smartphone. I'm not sure if it was an iPhone, but it's shot on a smartphone. And uh, I don't. I mean this nicely. It looks like it. <laughs> you know, it's not bad. Um, but it, obviously, you've seen you've seen nicer. Um, you've seen nicer looking films if you if you watch. I want to say properly shot films, but this is properly shot. No one really gives a shit what you shoot it on. But um, let's see. What is insane about... Well, you, you basically have whatever Claire Foy's name is. I can't remember right now. Um, and she goes and sees uh, the therapist. So basically what happens in this film is like one of my worst nightmares. Um, she sees the therapist because um, she's got some issues with a uh, stalker that she thinks is either after her again or she's envisioning him so she talks to a therapist and the end of the session she basically ends up without realizing it admitting herself into an institution an asylum whatever right um she doesn't realize that and uh by the time she does it's too late so she's basically held against her will and yeah, that's one of my worst nightmares. You're held against your will. You're basically a hostage, but because you signed some fucking paper that you didn't read properly, which is why you should always read anything you sign properly. Um, so now she ends up in there. And um, it's a very interesting story how how that happens, um, how she goes about trying to get out of there. So like she calls, you've probably seen it in the trailer, she calls the cops. She's like, hey, I'm in this institution. I'm here against my will. You have to get me out. And then someone goes like, how often do you think the cops are being told that? How many phone calls do you think they get like that? And she's like, shit, I'm really in trouble. What am I going to do? Um, so it's about her survival in the asylum uh, and about her trying to get out. And what is um, an additional layer to it is that you as a viewer at least I didn't I don't know maybe other people did you don't actually know whether she's actually crazy is she imagining this stalker or is that stalker actually there and it's quite interesting the way the film depicts that because it it leaves it quite ambiguous which is what I like I like when things are open to interpretation um, and even by the end of the film which I don't want to give away, it leaves it quite ambiguous, <laughs> you know? And I know a lot of people go like, so what's it mean? Like, was it real? Was it not real? Was it... Well, that's like, that's why we're here. Let's discuss it. That's why I'm here. Let's discuss it, right? That's that's what I like doing. Um, I want to I wanna know what what people think, what, what, they, what they think of the film, how it influenced them, what they actually think, what the outcome is. Um, which is why I quite like ambiguous endings um, where you can easily go like, no, man, she drove off into the sunset. Everything was fine. It's like, no, man, she drove off into the sunset. It's like, you know, it could be so many different things. Um, and that's what I like about it. And that's what Unsane does as well. And I don't really want to give it away whether she gets out, whether she's not, whether she's crazy or whether she's not. Um, it's a tour de force by that lady, Claire Foy. She is absolutely fantastic. Like, I mean, I already loved her in um, uh, in The Crown. But she is so good in Unsane. And one of the things why... I mean, I'm not entirely sure why Soderbergh decided to shoot this on an iPhone. Maybe I should have checked this. <laughs> I didn't do any research. But it feels like, you know, back in the day when they did like... Um, like super eight films, like home, that, that's what it is. It feels like a home video, like a, like a proper documentary or something. That's what the film feels like. And I wonder if that's what he was going for, because we've all seen, um, what was it? Tangerine? I think Tangerine was shot on an iPhone or even just w whatever iPhone footage that you've seen on YouTube or anywhere else. Like a lot of the iPhone footage looks really fucking fantastic. Um, like, not not necessarily like a film camera, but you know, close. Like it looks really good. It looks proper, um, and it has good technical aspects and stuff like that. And then you look at Unsane, and it feels like they were trying to make it look a bit cheap. I mean, I'm not sure if that's what they did, but I've seen better looking iPhone footage than Unsane. 
So I was quite surprised by that. Um, which is why I think that maybe he was going for this whole, I'm trying to make it look like a home video, Super 8 kind of a thing. Um, so the work, can we just have a chat about that? That'd be great. Call me. <laughs> um, but overall, I really like the film because it's very unsettling. Um, like I said, it's one of my worst nightmares. Um, you're held somewhere against your will. That's horrendous. Something just beeped. I don't know. We're still alive. We're still alive. Okay. Let it beep. Let it beep. Um, so it's very unsettling. And what she's going through, um, of course, the other patients that she's in the asylum with, you know, you don't know. It's like, are, are they crazy? Are they going through the same thing she's going through? Is it all a scam? What's going on? And a lot of stuff that is being um, talked about and revealed throughout the film is actually based on real events, as far as I know. Uh, I don't want to give it away because it would be a great spoiler. But some of the stuff that you're that is revealed near the end, you're just like, holy shit, this shit actually happens? What the fuck, man? That's so fucked up. Um, and she just does it really well. And then near the end of the film, there are things that Claire Foy does I thought I would never see Claire Foy do. You know, I mean, to be fair, all I can really think of is like Claire Foy is the queen, right? Um... But then there are scenes in there where I was like, holy shit. Like this film, seriously, this film is very unsettling. Uh, and I'm not unsettled by a lot of things. But I really loved it. And uh, if you're not into like this whole like high uh, uh, CGI blockbuster stuff, um, action bits, then if, if you're more into like drama and gritty stuff, this is the film that you want, want to go and see. Unsane. Um, it's really, really good. Um, had me on the edge of my seat pretty much the entire time. Um, so Claire Foy, she's marvelous. She's, she's great, but in, in a totally different aspect that what she does when she plays the queen and the crown. Um, and it was, it's fantastic. You have to go and see it. Like even if you're not into, into dramas and stuff, I think you need to go and see Unsane just for like for me when I want to go excuse me when I want to go and see a film one of the things that's really important to me is um, actors like who's in it like not necessarily that I need to have like an A-list actor in there otherwise I'm not going to go and see it that's bullshit I'll also watch a film if there are all no-name actors in there as long as it's a genre I like or the synopsis seems to indicate that I would like it uh, in theory, I want to see everything that comes out anyway, because you never know what you might miss when you go, oh, yeah, I don't think I really want to go and see this. Um, so in theory, I want to see any uh, everything anyway. But actors usually, like if, if Cape Blanchett, or like I said earlier, Margot Robbie in The Terminal, I don't need to know anything else about The Terminal, or, or is it just called Terminal? Whatever. Um, it just says Terminal, Margot Robbie. I don't need to know what it's about. I know Margaret Robbie's in it. I'm going to go and see it. Same with Cape Blanchett and a lot of other actors. You know, they are enough for me to go and check out any film, any genre. I will watch it. Um, and same now for Claire Foy. I really like her as an actress. Um, I thought she was brilliant as the queen. And now seeing her in Unsane, which is such a different kind of role. And she's just smashing it out of the park. It's phenomenal. Yeah, you, you need to go and see this. It's absolutely fantastic. So just remember, Pacific Rim for some action-y bits. But actually, if I think if you want to go... Can we go back? Yeah. So if you want to go see this, it's fine. I mean, if you really want to go and see some good action films, there's... Um, I, I mentioned Black Panther, right? I want to like wrap this up in like the next six minutes or so. I'm trying not to talk too much. And I know I rant and go on tangents and bullshit like that. But first broadcast, bear with me. This one, you can easily go and see it, I think. But it's... You watch it and you forget about it. This one, I think, will actually stick with you. Um, because it is just so much fun. And you need to repeatedly see it. Because there's so much going on. And... Between those two action films, I actually think um, Ready Player One is the better entertainment uh, than Pacific Rim. Even though Pacific Rim is really good. Uh, one of my mates um, 
he's not seen the first Pacific Rim and he's only seen the second one. And afterwards we were talking about it. And I was like, yeah, that was all right. It was like the first one, you know? And he was like, well, I haven't seen the first one. So I thought Pacific Rim Uprising was fucking fantastic. I was like, that was my reaction to the first one. That was fucking fantastic. Because we'd never seen ginormous robots battle ginormous kaiju in the middle of the sea. And then, yeah, I mean, they make it a tiny bit bigger, like 2.0-ish, or less, maybe more 1.5-ish in Uprising, because there's something at the end where you're like, oh my god, of course you're going to do this. I'm just saying, uh, <clears throat> Megazord, just take that however you want to. But, but if I had to choose between the two, if I could only watch one again, I would watch Ready Player One, no doubt there. And then, of course, insane. Let's not forget what else is in cinemas right now. Um, there's quite a lot coming out at the moment. Like You can literally rock up to the multiplex and just go, hmm, what do I feel like watching? There's literally so much going on. It's ridiculous. So we also have Eva DuVernay's uh, A Wrinkle in Time is Out, which I've not seen yet. Um, I want to see it, but it's not very high on my list, to be quite honest. I've never read the book. I don't know anything about it other than Eva DuVernay um, directed it. And I love her. You know, she did Selma. She did 13th. She's amazing. Lots of people raving about it. Um, but that's people that like the book. I think it's based on a book. Um, I don't know it. So maybe it's like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and other things where if you grew up with it, you're going to love it. If you didn't grow up with it, you're like, meh. Apparently as a film itself, without nostalgia and stuff, not that great. So I'm hearing very mixed reviews, but I'm still going to go and see it. And then, of course, Black Panther is still running. Um, you need to go and see this, seriously. If, if you've still not seen it, and it's the 29th of March now, and if you've not seen Black Panther, Jesus Christ, you need to stop everything else and go and see that film. It's fucking fantastic. Just say, Wakanda forever. Um, it's great. Like, if you like, if you like action films, you're going to love it. If you like, um, really cool, witty dialogue, you're going to love it. If you like women in lead roles, you're going to love it. Lots of women in lots of kick-ass roles. Awesome. Um, handsome men taking their shirts off. Awesome. Uh, you have Andy Serkis doing his Andy Serkis thing and he's fucking fantastic. You just, like, there's... I'm trying to come up with something why you wouldn't want to go and see Black Panther. There's just nothing. It's just great. Just watch it. Um, and then, of course, uh, quick shout out to Game Night, which is a surprisingly fantastic film. I, I watched, I already watched it twice, actually. Um, it's about a bunch of people coming together for Game Night. And they have a neighbor who they are kind of excluding from Game Night. Um, and then someone else's brother is showing up for game night and that brother goes like oh I'm gonna up game night and I'm gonna get some people in who are gonna pretend like they're gonna take one of us hostage and the other people have to go and find it and then turn if you've seen the trailer and then it turns out that that hostage taking is actually <clears throat> not fake and then all kinds of shenanigans ensue and it sounds really stupid and I didn't expect much from it but it is so much fun it's like ready player one but more realistic comedic action you know it, it's really fantastic if you haven't seen game night yet you need to go and check it out rachel mcadams is in it and jason bateman um and carly bunbury who i'm slightly crushing on because she's gorgeous um it's really funny from start to finish doesn't have pacing issues the entire thing is hilarious from a to z it is really good sitcom stuff funny dialogue stuff it is like, I was so surprised how much I loved it. Like I said, in the last month, I've seen it twice. Um, Pacific Rim Uprising. And oh yeah, let's not forget Tomb Raider. Oh my God. One minute left. Quickly. Alicia Vikander. I actually said Alicia, not Alicia. Okay. Alicia Vikander is really good as Lara Croft. I really didn't think I was going to like it um, because she's always like this. She seemed to be this dainty little petite person. I was like, there's no way that she can play a Lara Croft. She can. Like, she is Alicia Vikander action star. She is fantastic. I really, really loved her in it. And I prefer this, this image background. Um, Tomb Raider, 
I mean, you, you have this usual silly, borderline stupid story that you always have in Tomb Raider. But what they did in this one is they were trying to ground it a bit more in reality. So the explanation near the end, they're trying to give it like a scientific approach. I'm going to run over an hour, guys. Sorry, I got to I got to talk about Tomb Raider now. I'm a huge fan of Tomb Raider. Um, never of the original games. I've never really played them, but the re vamped versions or the reimagining or whatever you want to call it where we had a more normal <coughs> looking Lara um, and this is kind of what the film is based on and that, that's also what she looks like and she's really good and uh, my god I've seen her workout video she's a beast like seriously she's got muscle that's like Ur! um it's fantastic and there's a lot of great action sequences in, in Tomb Raider it's, sometimes it feels like they just put this action sequence in there because they wanted to put an action sequence in there or that there was something in the video game that they were like oh, we gotta put this in the movie and I did not mind one bit there's action after action after action after action then there's like a little puzzle and then there's more action and all the action is really like down, dirty, gritty, amazing um, which I didn't really think that that is the thing that Alicia Vikander would be into but she's selling it really, really well. I really liked what she what she did there. It feels so gritty and real. And, and some of the stuff that happens there, I literally went, it's like, oh, you know, some of the stuff is, oh, yeah, heavy. Some heavy stuff, some ridiculous stuff. Overall, um, I really enjoyed it. I was really surprised. Like the start, it doesn't have the best start. It, it It's a bit slow to start and a bit ludicrously ridiculous in regards to the story and and everything but once you get going then it's really good and by the end of it I was like man where's the sequel tell me they're making the sequel I want to get tickets to the sequel like right now um I want to see a lot more of that Alicia Vikander as Lara Croft is fantastic I bought it from A to Z um yeah I'm like oh I almost bought the ending there who caught me there it's really good. Some stuff is obviously it's the first film and what we all hope is going to be a franchise. Um, there are certain things that are being set up for, for future uh, films. And I do hope that they get a future film because it's really, really good. And I believe that she's Lara Croft. There are certain bits in there that I would want to talk to the writer about. It's like, seriously, if you had just rewritten this slightly, this would have made a lot more sense. It would have felt a lot more like Lara Croft and Tomb Raider. Why you chose to write it like this, I'm not sure. It's like, I basically want to have a coffee date with the writer slash director. I'm not sure if the director actually wrote it. But as far as, you know, if you compare it to the Angelina Jolie ones, which I also like and I also hate because there are things in there that I really like and there are things in there I really hate. Um, but they were fun, you know, and you had a female protagonist which was really rare. And obviously in the last year we had quite a a lot of them not, not really a lot like compared to how many male protagonists you have it's nothing but we had Wonder Woman and we had Charlize in Atomic Blonde and then of course we had all the amazing ladies in Black Panther and I'm probably forgetting something of course yeah we had Star Wars you know Rey in Star Wars even though for whatever reason she's no longer the lead she's just one of the ensemble I don't know uh yeah Trying to talk about The Last Jedi and what Ryan Johnson did to it. That would warrant an entire new broadcast, so let's not go there. Um, but yeah, if, if you want to go and see some really good action films, you've got Pacific Rim, you've got Ready Player One. Yes, go see Ready Player One. And you've got Tomb Raider if you want to see like a, a female-led action film. It's really good. Um, obviously, not very cerebral. Leave your brain at the door kind of a thing. Um, but it's a lot of fun and there's a lot of action in there and it's a lot of gritty action and I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, certain bits don't make sense, but you know, it's a Tomb Raider film. Certain bits are not supposed to make sense, I guess. So, um, I've been running four minutes over. I do apologize. I do try to get into the one hour, but it's the first time I'm doing this. So we'll figure it out. Um, let's see. Can we go back? No. There we go. I'm Mel. This was I Love Cinema. I'm going to be back next Thursday at 8 p.m. It's always going to be Thursdays, 8 p.m. UK time, just in case you're not in the UK. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the movies I've seen or whatever else 
um, you know, is, is coming into my head. So it's like maybe I've seen a great film on TV, so maybe I'm going to talk about this. But usually I'm going to be focusing on the cinema. Um, I'm probably going to be talking about more Ready Player One because I would have seen it in 3D. Uh, maybe Wrinkle in Time. Oh, if you get a chance. Actually, I just found it out five seconds before I went live. There's a new film called, um, called Proud Mary starring Taraji P. Henson. It's out like right now. There's a screening happening right about now in the cinema world. Um, and I thought it was release day today and I was going to go and see it on Saturday. Turns out it's a very limited release and for whatever reason it's only showing today, tomorrow and maybe on Saturday but only in two cinemas. I really want to see Proud Mary if you don't know what that is. YouTube the trailer. It's kind of like Atomic Blonde, but with Tarashi P. Henson instead of Charlie Theron. Um, it looks really cool, you know. Tarashi being sassy and killing people and shooting people and just taking names and kicking ass. How can I not watch this? I do hope it gets a proper release. I'm not sure if it does. I can't find any information for that. So if you get a chance to watch that, like either tomorrow or day after tomorrow, Go and see it. It looks like it's on a very limited release and I'm going to miss it. So hopefully you're a bit more lucky than I am. See you next Thursday, guys.